Welcome back everyone, this is Chad with IREC Veteran 8888. Today we're battling the air made of hot soup and incessant insects down here in South Georgia at the rifle range to bring you the Remington 700 from hell. You think that's a good enough name for this thing? Yes, it is. Yeah. Because it <laughs> certainly is. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to take a few shots and then I'm going to tell you about this rig. This, this video has been a very long time coming. Those of you who have been with us on the channel, you've probably seen this rifle in this configuration and suppressor reviews and stuff, but you've probably seen what it started out as. And if you've watched some of our gun gripes and such, you know sort of the backstory of what I'm going to get at in this video. But um, we're going to try this thing out. This is chambered in 308, all right, 308, right, as we like to say. Um, I'm trying uh, a 10 round compact. Uh, AICS type magazine from American Rifle Company. I used this in the Begara B14 video recently and I was having problems with it. The first issues I've ever had out of this magazine was when the cameras were rolling. So we're gonna try it again. Um, it, it's supposed to be able to handle pretty much any short action cartridge that you can stuff in it. So, uh, but like I said, we'll talk more about the rig in a minute. Pray. Pray the magazine works, please. The cameras are on, but it's okay. It's okay. And we're just going for the gusto. We're going to start at 300. Okay. So, uh, easy. Boop. All right, I'm on it. All right. <clears throat> I'm running a Leupold Mark IV spotter with a tactical milling reticle in it. Very nice spot and scope. One day I'll teach you how to use that thing. Yeah, for real. <laughs> yeah, it's not that hard. I mean, the nice thing about the tactical milling reticle is it does give you instant feedback. Like, you can tell the shooter, you know, how far they're missing and give them instant feedback. Yep. Pretty cool. All right, 297, and let's see. What have we got here for wind? 0 0.3, 0 0.25, 0 0.25. <clears throat> All right, I am sending center mass. Go. <sighs> and uh, that mass. is a perfect center mass impact. Oh gosh, yeah. If I do say so myself. All right, let's see. Oh, it chambered. <laughs> right, let's see if we can replicate that. That's good. Beautiful. Okay. I think it's safe to say that uh, 300 yards is child's play. Yep, all right, so let's push to four real quick. We're gonna be shooting out to 650 today. Um, you know, 308 kind of falls apart past about 800 yards. We don't have that particular range out here. Uh, we can only shoot from 650 and then we have to go over and we can shoot another position all the way out to almost 1,000. But this thing, just in, in, in my previous testing, it literally just falls apart. The 175s just really can't handle it in this particular barrel length because this is just a 20. I'm not getting all that extra steam out of the extra four to six inches of barrel. So we're not gonna bore you guys with it. We're gonna keep it within the practical range of 308, right? Yep. I mean, <clears throat> all right, so four. <clears throat> 1.97, we're gonna dial the two and um, just so you guys know, the device I'm reaching up here and playing with is a Kestrel HUD. Uh, I've got the 5700 Elite on the weather vane set up on a tripod over here, just kind of out on the road away from anything, so it's getting a good collection of the wind data up here. Um, I'm looking at environmentals downrange for wind, uh, and the HUD connects to the Kestrel and it gives me just a heads up display of my target card, so I can see all of my targets, the elevation I need to correct, windage, uh, trace, time of flight, spin drift, all the data that the Kestrel is capable of collecting, I can access it right here. Uh, it's a pretty neat device. We may do a dedicated video on it, but this is the first uh, range outing that I've been you know, able to use the Kestrel HUD on, and so far it's been working out beautifully. So two mils, all right, and we're gonna go for 400. I'll shoot the D28 first, and then we'll move to the Coyote. Run it. <clears throat> All right, a little bit too much wind. Okay. 
Well, those three stacked uh, probably inside of two inches, maybe two and a half inches. Okay. Not shoot, bad. Yeah, let me shoot the kayak real quick. Go ahead. Go for a center mass. Right in the boiler room. Center mass again. Oh yeah, that's a that's a very unhappy coyote. All right, headshot. Oh yeah, domed him. Good shot. All right, headshot on the D28. Maybe. Oh. Just over the shoulder. I think you clipped the shoulder. Yeah, maybe just yeah, a little the, bit. The round hit hit the shoulder yep. on the edge of the plate. A little bit too much wind hold. All right. <laughs> he he would have known you were there. Let's oh yeah. That way. Well, that's a four inch. That's a four inch target. It's a half size D28. So if it would have been a full size D28, you know, probably would have hit him. You know. All right. So look. The reason I call this the Remington 700 from Hell is because this thing started out as a project to take a base rifle, all right? I bought a Remington 700 AAC SD, okay? And at the time, it was like 699 bucks. And this was, God, six years ago, maybe more. I mean, yeah. it was forever ago, it seems. But I bought this rifle and I wanted to take it out, shoot a baseline test with factory ammunition, maybe develop some hand loads for it, and collect all that data, velocity data, the whole nine yards, right? Everything I could do. And I wanted to improve certain features. I wanted to upgrade the trigger. I wanted to uh, drop it in like a chassis system. I wanted to upgrade the barrel uh, and do all the little things that you can, uh, you can do to these rifles. Cause I mean, they're highly customizable. I mean, Remington 700s are just, they're, they're a great starting point for custom guns. They're the um, AR-15 of bolt actions. They, they really are, I mean, in the big scheme of things. But <clears throat> I wanted to document that progress along the way and see what, uh, what gave the best improvement in accuracy and precision, uh, what may not have worked real well. But the, the plan was cut short because after about 250 rounds in, uh, I discovered that the barrel was not true to the action and it was off a considerable amount to the point where only one bolt lug was contacting, uh, you know, the extension there. And um, like, it just killed me. I, I, everything I had done up to that point was just a complete waste of time, more or less. So I just decided, you know, I'm gonna have Ray take this gun. I'm gonna have him true the action up. I'm just gonna drop a Criterion barrel on it. So I bought a Criterion Remage style barrel I had Ray, um, Ray at Moss, you know, our gunsmith, we've been working with for years. He cut the barrel back, threaded it for me, 20 inches, I wanted a nice compact setup, uh, trued up the action, I dropped a, um, a PT&G, one piece bolt assembly in it. Uh, it's got a jewel trigger in it now, and I've ran this KRG chassis system. This is a, a little bit older generation, Whiskey 3, uh, with the folding mech and everything and Ryan up there, the apprentice gunsmith at the time, he Cerakoted the whole rig for me. And um, after that, you know, the rifle shot great. It was basically a custom rifle. The only stock component left on it was the action. But I just never got around to doing a video with it because this thing wound up being like a suppressor test bed. So I would test uh, different suppressors on it all the time and it never stayed in one configuration. We would test various optics on it. I never left it alone. Everything was always getting swapped around on it. Uh, so I think finally I've got it in the configuration that I want it to stay in. I've got another gun that we can do suppressor metering and stuff with now. So this one is pretty much going to stay as you see it. And this is a, this is a nice, you know, semi-custom rifle. I, I say semi-custom because it didn't start out with a custom action, which would really be the, the icing on the cake. Uh, cause man, the custom actions that are out there, there's so many of them now and they are all phenomenal pieces of equipment, but they come with a pretty high price point. Um, but, uh, pretty much gave you like the specs of this, this rig here, but we're running an Atlas bipod up front, uh, and up top for the optic, <clears throat> I've got a spur mount and I've got a Mark V HD 3.6 to 18 sitting in it, which these optics, the, the five HDs are arguably some of the best like entry level 
high-end optics that you can get and they're super lightweight they don't add a lot to the overall setup especially when you're dealing with kind of a heavy precision rifle like this they've got great reticles great features great adjustability a huge range that they can work within and the spur mounts i mean they're they're just the most fantastic one piece bases out there for precision use uh, we've been using the spurs for years and we've never had a problem with them they've always held their own and I, I, I can say with, you know, just full confidence that as long as you set these things up right and torque them down properly, you will never have your optic being a variable in some problem that you're having that you have to diagnose. It's just a fantastic piece of equipment, just overall. Up front, I'm running one of the new KGM Technologies R30 suppressors. This is an all titanium precision rifle suppressor with a built-in uh, APEC system, which is an adjustable port end cap. Uh, it's basically a series of threaded holes that act as like an e-brake. So you get the best of both worlds. You get massive recoil reduction, plus great sound reduction and very minimal POI shift, if any at all. Uh, just for example, this rig I was running uh, an older AAC Cyclone on, you know, it's long, heavy, uh, like nine inch suppressor. Uh, they're meant more for precision rifles. They're just direct thread, uh, kind of a classic, you know, style can. I've been running that on there for a while and developed my hand loads with it and everything. When I dropped this can on there, I did not have to change my zero for one thing, and it actually improved my accuracy slightly. So this is a sub MOA capable rifle. Most of the time it hovers right around the 0 0.5, 0 0.6 mark. As you saw downrange just now, I mean, stacking rounds in at three and 400 yards like child's play. Um, but this is a really cool rig. It just took a long time and a lot of effort and heartache and headache to get here. Um, but there, there's so many m more things you can do with custom Remington 700s these days. And just, if I had it to do over again, I probably would have just started from the ground up with a custom action and not had all the extra expense in buying a rifle and pretty much parting everything out except for the receiver. Like basically the receiver cost me $700 at this point because I'm not using anything else. The Hogue stock is gone. The other barrel is gone. I mean, but if you're wanting to do something like this, I implore you, save up your money and just start fresh with a quality action that you know is gonna be trued up and have a competent gunsmith install the barrel on there. And once everything is aligned, that's like the biggest piece of the puzzle right there. Just having the, the receiver and the barrel in perfect co-centricity with each other, that makes all the difference in the world. And it really leads to a highly accurate platform. So anyways, enough talking. That gives you guys an idea of what this rig's capable of. And uh, look, thank you very much to our friends at Coltac. They always keep us in good gear. I'm running the ammo novel right here with all of my ammunition. These, these are hand loads that I'm running here. These are 175 grain hand loads on uh, Varget with some uh, Lapua brass. <clears throat> I'm running an HTP suppressor cover up front. Uh, this is one of their higher end covers. It's got a, a heat shield inside with the wrap on the outside. Uh, it does help a lot with the Mirage, especially with the titanium cans because they heat up pretty quickly and uh, they start you know, giving off that Mirage and it can really throw your shots off at long range. And I'm also running a waxed uh, Wooby bag in the back. So these things are great, you know, real durable material and that's just helping me kind of get on target and stuff. And um, Magpul Sling, I mean, green, of course. I mean, you gotta keep it all green. I mean, look at me. Like, what's my favorite color? Apparently it's green, Chad. I love green. Hide in the woods green. All right, so look. Go out to five? Five, we're gonna go to five. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I but, will say that any stock upgrade over those Hogues is a great improvement. Uh, they flex yeah. way too, I mean, look, Hogue makes a fine stock, make no mistake, but they, uh, they really do flex too much for precision use. They do, and there's a lot of contact points with the barrel and the action and everything, and every shot, you know, it never settles back in properly. The benefit of the chassis is everything is tightened down, you know, 65 inch pounds. The barrel is completely free floated. You got 100% contact. I mean, it's just, they're fantastic. And you don't have to go through the, the expense of having, uh, well, and mess if you do it yourself and risk of gluing your rifle together, uh, doing like steel bedding and all. Um, steel bedded, you know, chassis and stocks and stuff, they're, they're great. But for ease of use and just buying and dropping it in and having a huge improvement in the accuracy potential of a given rifle, the chassis are, are a pretty awesome upgrade. 
I like and, the Hogue 1022 stocks a lot, but that's about it. <laughs> the Hogue, oh, the 1022s? Yeah, they're, they're <laughs> because they're light. Yeah. All right, so look, that mag uh, actually worked quite well with this particular ammunition. I don't know why I was having problems with the 6.5 Creed. I mean, I literally used that mag for like a thousand rounds of testing in that thing and never had a single problem out of it until today. How many rounds you got out of that barrel now? This barrel? Yeah. Uh, I'm hitting like the 1200 mark. So it's still got some considerable life left in it, but it's still it's, shooting good. Yeah, it's gonna have to probably be replaced. Yeah, you know, maybe eh, about 3,000 rounds or so, I think is about what these barrels can kind of take. So really it's about broke in in the sweet spot now. Yeah, it's just a uh, 416R stainless, I believe is what Criterion uses. Um, They're good barrels, man. They are. And the rimage system makes, makes life easy because you can just headspace the barrel and then tighten the barrel nut down and that's it, you're, you're done. Is that and, the gun you did the M16 extractor on? Uh, yes, yeah. So this one has an M16 extractor. It's, uh, it was actually stock uh, in the bolt. So came from the factory like that. Let's go. All right, 500 and we're at three mils. Yep. Okay, and boop. 0.43 mils right for wind. Oh, I like days like this. Yeah, other than heat. Yeah. All right, 500. Send it when ready. Right, I'm just adjusting my parallax here on the on the Louie. All right, and we're looking at that stick in, right? Yep. Okay. Right, I'm up. We, okay, let's see what we got. I love those 175s, man. They shoot good. Uh -oh. oh yeah. You're in there. I'm sure you can see that. Oh yeah. Good shot. Okay, you guys notice the uh, amount of recoil reduction. I mean, I'm shooting full power, 175 grain loads, and the rifle is barely moving. I can spot my shot all the way down range. That's great. Look at that. Yep. Oh, yeah. All right. Take Let's that see. gopher out. Take the gopher out? Yeah, aim, aim kind of along his backbone. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. I'm holding maybe a little bit too much for wind. I got you. Yep. Send it. Just off the back of his uh, neck. Okay. Maybe an inch or two. Got it. Oh, yeah. Right in the belly. You eviscerated him. All right, so that's an MOA size target. That's a five inch target in the belly, a three inch target on the head. Just uh, past his noggin, just yeah. off the back. He missed his head by an inch. So, was you aiming at the head? Well, no, I, I was aiming at the body again, but just as I broke the shot, the wind literally just stopped down range. I see. So, okay. Yeah, wind picked up. Yep, I got you. Just off the back of his neck. Yep, wind picked up a little bit more. It sure did. That's a little target, man. Oh, yeah. Okay. Good shot. There we go. You want to dial up to uh, six? Yep. <sighs> well, that mag is working well. Mag is working well. All right. That's strange. I know. It. I don't know, man. It's. I wanted to try these mags because the like mag pulls. Um, you've got the five rounders, like a normal AICS mag. The ten rounders stick out to here. Same thing with like the Accuracy International mags. So these are a, a semi-staggered that come up and um, you got a single feed at the top, but the rounds stagger in so you get a nice compact uh, form factor, but 10 rounds, you know, a 10 round capacity. So- Who makes those mags that I bought for the, uh, for the GRS rigs that we put together? Uh, you had, I think some, maybe Lancers and MDTs? Yeah, the, yeah, MDT. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a, a, a um, hybrid polymer and steel. So it's got steel feed lips that are molded in with the polymer to keep it light and they got a, a window where you can see the round count. Yep. I haven't really <clears> done a lot of testing but they work okay. And they're cheap. Yeah. They're like 30 bucks. Well, so I got nice. these uh, through Area 419. They were running a sale a while back so I bought one of these along with uh, some mounts and such to try. And um, <clears throat> oh, speaking of the, the mount, uh -oh. spoke too soon. Maybe I loaded too many rounds. Yeah, that might be 10, let's see. Maybe that was a problem with the Creedmoor. You might've tried to stuff one too many rounds in huh? there. Yeah, maybe. 
Oh yeah, it's it's in there now. Maybe I did uh, overload it by one. I wasn't we'll actually counting because we're we'll filming. Test that theory out. Um, yeah, so with this uh, suppressor up here, I'm just running the factory uh, 5 8 by 24 direct thread adapter. Um, it just threads in the rear, and they are ASR threaded, so you get that, you know, basically universal capability with pretty much any mounting system that's on the market. But I like to use direct thread or the Area 419 um, Hellfire type mounts. Uh, it's a insert that goes into the suppressor, and it's got a, a taper mount, and it's left-hand threaded to a mount uh, that's tapered onto the barrel. And it just gives a nice repeatable, um, a repeatable form of function. So, all right, let's go, uh, let's go six. Um, Ready when you are. Yep, so we're at 411. <clears throat> and 0.5 right for wind. Yeah, man, up. I'm telling you, man, technology makes long range shooting so easy these days. Definitely helps take the guesswork out of it. It does, man. I, I like data. I'm a, I'm a data nerd and math is my jam. So. Send it when ready. All right. <clears throat> a little bit of a crosswind. It's it, not too bad. Okay, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna give it a 0.5 hold and see where we're at. Low right. I see it. See yep. it? And I have not trued this thing up, so that's something that I'll be doing today is uh, just doing a quick muzzle velocity correction um, on the Kestrel. So what that'll allow for is the furthest range that I shoot, when I true it up, it'll basically fine tune all the other ranges in between. Um, it's a way to just fine tune your data because when you chrono, when you chrono uh, a given load, you know, chronographs can be off by maybe 10, 15, 20 feet per second in either direction. So this is a way to kind of true that velocity up and also make sure that the BC of your projectile is proper as well. Now, Brian Litz, I mean, the man's a mad genius when it comes to this stuff. So, all right. Okay, I remember that I needed to hold another temp. So that's where that, um, that slight error came from, Eric. Go for it. Okay, I'm gonna hold a temp. Yep, perfect um, windage. Yep, that one's still a little bit low. Let me shoot a group with that same point of aim. Do it. Okay, that's back where it needed to be. Heck yeah. Yeah, okay, it's not too bad. It's about a tenth low, but that's okay. All right, let me run to, uh, let me run to 650. Do it. <clears throat> We've got a half size D28 and an eight inch popper at 650. All right, I'm gonna go 4.8. Kestrel's showing 4.79. We'll hold uh, 0.5. Your 6.5 Creed, I believe, was 4.3, right? It was. So, look, this is a pretty hot hand load. It just happened to fall into a higher accuracy node when I was doing my load development. Um, and out of this 20 inch barrel, these 175s are running 2689. So it's pretty cooking. Uh, that's about where you would normally see like factory gold metal match ammunition from Federal out of like a 24 or 26 inch barrel. Um, the Criterions, they're just, with any custom barrel really, they're just finely uh, finished and hand lapped and everything and that really smooth surface finish inside the bore gives you that extra little boost of velocity. Um, even factory ammunition was faster in this barrel compared to stock offerings that I've tested as well. Um, but 308 is just a classic cartridge and everybody really needs a, a bolt action chambered in 308 because it's just a real practical uh, type setup. But you can see the thing's delivering the goods. I've got a few rounds left here. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll finish this out at 650, and then, I mean, you guys get the idea. We'll let you get back to your day, but that, that mag is not quite working as well in this chassis as I would like. Not quite as smooth. The Magpul 5-rounders work fantastic and everything, but like I said, just kind of testing some other magazines as well. All right, 4.8. I've never had a problem out of my AI mags, but granted, they yeah, are very they're AIs. They're good mags. They sure are. But for the money, man, the mag pulls are hard to beat. Yep. Okay. 
Go for it. <clears throat> All right, we've got a half size D28. So that's a four inch head and then a 10 inch wide body, 20 inch tall target out at 651 yards. Okay. And I've got no seams in my ears and my <laughs> eyes. Send it when ready. Okay. <clears throat> All right. I'm gonna give it the same uh, 0.5 wind hold to start with. Got a little bit down there going on. It's the left edge of the plate. Yep, I see it. You're in a there. A little bit more wind than I considered. Yep. Center mass. On the bottom. Yep. Starting to kind of get squirrely out there. And like I said, guys, 308, man, it just starts kind of falling apart out at range. But let me let me try the popper just for fun. Go for it. It's an eight inch uh, target out there. So uh, like maybe what, 1.2 in my way or so, if my math is right. Yeah, and the uh, the six five Creed definitely has some better inherent accuracy potential. It, it does, man. That that two sixty four size bullet, man. Long bearing surface. Ooh, go. Ooh, getting me excited. Looks like you shot high. Okay. Yeah, and look, my ammo is kind of sitting out here in the sun. I mean, Var gets pretty temperature stable, but. It's not like 46. Uh, yeah, it is 100 degrees out here. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's not quite the same as like 4350, like what I run in the Creedmoor. So let me just see if I can get a shot on there. If not, I'll take a few more shots at the D28. I mean, we're talking like practicality here. <clears throat> Send it. Looks like it was high again. Hmm. But it's really hard to spot. Yeah, it's okay. It gets in that corner down yeah, there. Yeah, I can't quite see through that shadow trace. Let me try the D28 one more time and kind of Go see where it. it's at. Impact. Low right, you see it? Yeah, I saw it. All right. All right, I was going for the uh, the popper one more time. I didn't see it. It's okay. I wasn't looking there. <laughs> All right, look, there's a, uh... okay. Look, I'm gonna shoot um, two rounds, Eric, and I'm gonna keep the same point of aim. And I wanna know where it is on the plate. All right. If you can spot it. Yep, send okay. it. Ready? Mm-hmm. Up in the shoulder on the left edge of the plate. Okay. You see it? Yep. So two I'm holding more. just center mass, not for wind, because it looked like it died down a little bit. Let me do one more. Those two rounds, okay. Chad, stacked right on top of each yeah, other. Yeah, I saw them. Uh, I was aiming here. They hit about right here. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. So now I've got a little data to go off of. It's now shoot that. A popper. Okay. Well, yeah, I'll shoot the popper. Hang on. A aim in the lower right edge of the popper. Yep. I know where it's hitting, so now I can kind of true it up. Yep. <clears throat> you clipped it. Clipped it. Barely clipped it off the top left edge, it looked like. Okay. It barely moved. <sighs> yep. That that might have been just right over the top, Chad. <laughs> well, Barely. I guess I guess the eight inch target with the 308, it's not going to happen today. I mean, I have we we have been shooting this thing quite a bit. Barrel is scorching hot, ammo is scorching hot, so it might be throwing some extra variables into the mix. But for all practicality, I mean, if you need to shoot anything between you know 100 500 yards, I mean 308 is is going to deliver some good energy with some pretty reasonable accuracy if you do your part and you have a good setup and everything for it. 
But once you push out past 500 yards, I know guys do it. I know I'm probably going to get some hate comments in the in the comment box down there. But thing is, like, once you get out past like six and all, really, there's much better cartridges that are available now for that task. I mean, 6.5 Creedmoor. If you guys watched our previous Bagara video, I mean, 6.5 is just a laser beam. It's got good velocity, good energy on target, good terminal performance, and it's just a fantastic bore diameter uh, and cartridge design. It has everything you could ever want, and the powders that are available for hand loaders uh, to make that thing really shine, factory ammunition that's out there. I mean, you can easily get those guns down in the sub half MOA range. 308 is not going anywhere anytime soon. It's definitely not dead. Um, but I hope you guys enjoyed you know, this look at this rifle and kind of the story behind it. Uh, I know some other people have kind of gone through the same thing in the past, uh, but this is, this is my take on kind of the 308 from Hill, the, the 700 from Hill. Uh, but I think that in its current configuration, it's a very usable uh, piece of equipment. And uh, really the only thing moving forward that I'll have to do is just uh, replace the barrel once it starts wearing out and then just develop a hand load again, load up a bunch of ammo and then set it in the corner until it's needed, you know, for video testing, whatever the case might be. But um, anyways, guys, thank you so much for watching today. If you guys want to support what we do, you can head over to Ballistic Inc. and pick yourself up an awesome new t-shirt. Uh, there's new designs that are being developed all the time over there by the mad scientists at work in the, uh, in the Ballistic Inc. dungeon, okay? So just stay tuned to the website and you'll find all kinds of crazy shirt designs. Uh, some a little bit louder than others, but all those funds go right back into supporting this content that you see here. And uh, stay tuned, man. Uh, you know, we've got a lot more on the way and uh, just stay tuned to the channel. We always have something crazy going on. So you guys take care. See you next time.